My name is Eva Wilson. I'm Miss Earth New Zealand 2021, and this is my interview with the Pageant Project. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Pageant Project. My special guest for today is Eva Wilson, who is Miss Earth New Zealand 2021. Eva, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. I was going to chant saying kia ora, but I didn't want to risk it because my pronunciation <laughs> is so bad. So for the people watching at home, especially those tuning in overseas, can you just explain kia ora, what it means and the significance? So kia ora, it's sort of like a rolled R is how I'll describe the trick to pronouncing it. Um, we generally use it as hello, but it's similar to, I think another culture would be Hawaii, for example, where aloha can mean hello, goodbye, just a general acknowledgement. So kia ora in general, it's like a sort of casual way to introduce yourself to someone you'd be like oh kia ora but just say you're listening to someone speak and you agree with what they're saying you could also sit back and say oh kia ora you know to agree with them so it's got a few different uses generally all good <laughs> i used to work with a whole bunch of new zealanders which is why i know the phrase and they they would say they i don't think they ever said good morning or hello it was always kia ora even kia ora. in australia yeah, like, <laughs> keep i had difficulty rolling simple. I do. I have trouble rolling my R's, so it's never been the easiest phrase for me to say. Um, look, obviously, Miss Earth is well and truly underway now. Um, as I was mentioning to you before, you poor Kiwis have probably the time slot, the only time slot that's worse than us Aussies. I was on the judging panel the other night starting at 11 p.m. I didn't get to bed until 2 in the morning. Mm -hmm. What's it been like for you? What have the call times been like? Um, so generally so far, the call times have all been about 1 a.m. Um, I think for the week coming up, I have one that's about midnight, which will be very forgiving, and I will take full advantage of that later start or earlier start, sorry for me, so that would be good. Um, I have actually done a pageant in the Philippines, so I remember being on that time schedule, and the difficulty with it isn't the mornings, because in the morning you get to sleep in what feels like 11, 12 each day, which was fun. It was when you're doing your activities in the evening and it's now getting to New Zealand time, 3 a.m. and you have to be top of your game. So, yeah, it's been a little bit difficult. I did see, um, I believe Miss USA on one of her posts, I could be wrong, said she had a call time of 3.30 in the morning for one of them. Yeah, so it's been a difficult for a fair few countries. Luckily, I'm a bit of a night owl, I think. <laughs> Well, you have no choice after this, do you? Um, Marissa, who's Miss Earth USA, yeah, that was for some of her interviews she was doing because a lot of the interviews were on Filipino. Nope. Sorry, Eva, can you hear me? Am I back? Oh, sorry. Yes, I can hear you now. Yes. interview my, my internet Australian internet um, but as I was saying Marissa's interviews a lot of them were Filipino based and so she was having to wake up at about 3 30 in the morning yeah. to get them done so I don't think she's I don't know if she's a morning but I at this stage do you know if you're a morning person a night owl or do you just have to wake up whenever you have to wake up and get it done I think outside of pageantry I am a night owl um, during pageantry um, whatever time they need me to be there. So I think that's sort of the general theme is that whatever time they say is the time you have to be there and you you get used to it pretty quickly. Um, this isn't this isn't my first pageant, so I think it's lucky that I knew to expect that, if anything. It can be quite overwhelming, yeah. especially when you're new, the schedules, realising how much background work goes into it and realising how demanding it can be on your body as well as like being on top of your game mentally all the time. But there's a certain... I don't know, like adrenaline rush that you get doing these sort of extreme tasks at random hours. So like it's quite fun at the same time as being quite overwhelming. Has it been different for you doing it virtually? I mean, as you said, it's not your first pageant, but this one obviously is a bit different because everything's been virtual, not not just by virtue of the international, but my understanding is a lot of the 
in locally for New Zealand, a lot of that was virtual for you as well. So has that been very different to your previous experience? Yeah, I, I would say it's actually been hugely different. The The dynamic of the whole competition has changed. Um, some ways for the better, some ways for the worse. I think for the, for, so our national one, we ended up holding the um, the final in a virtual situation just because we went into lockdown about three or four days before we were meant to have our final night. So we had rehearsed everything in person. We had everything ready. Oh, no. I was <laughs> orange with spray tan, ready for my Saturday debut as an orange on stage. You know, I had all of that ready. <laughs> And then yeah. so for it to switch to virtual it was quite a challenge. And since I work in public health, I was at the VAC centres during the day. So that's a 7 a.m. or 7.30 sort of start, um, usually finishing in the afternoon nap, then getting up, trying to sort my lighting out in my room so I could film because I wasn't getting the daylight hours to mm. submit my sort of project. So it was a lot of negotiating that. Um, for the international, though, since we knew it was going to be virtual, that sort of had a different spin, although we didn't realize we were going to be in lockdown whilst doing the virtual. So that has been a huge, huge barrier for me. And it's been really tough <laughs> trying to organize things. My flat, unfortunately for them, but fortunately for me, have now become my studio for a lot of what's going on because we're not allowed to leave our bubble for a lot of our content. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been very different, hugely different experience. Let, let, let's just go into the situation in New Zealand a little bit at the moment because it being so global and I've interviewed people from all sorts of different countries now, a lot of the world has sort of gone back to normal and opened up and uh, I've told them that Australia or well, Sydney where I am has only recently as in the last two weeks opened back up. Melbourne, they've now had the most days in lockdown out of any city in the world. Not, not just Australia, in the world, the poor things. Um, they've had earthquakes. They just had a storm. What's the situation in New Zealand been like? So for the majority of the pandemic, we've been very, very lucky just by virtue of the fact that we are an island. We're relatively isolated. Mm. And we had a government who chose to go for an elimination strategy right off the bat. So that clear direction gave our population as a whole quite a clear direction a goal to get to which was just zero cases so we yeah. for a prior to delta coming to new zealand our goal had always just been elimination now that delta has entered the country um as of an august that strategy has had to flip just because our lockdowns haven't been as effective as they previously had been um the amount of time we've been in lockdown at the previous strains of covid it should have been gone to zero by now whereas we're still seeing it flatten and yeah. due to the fact we've been in lockdown for so long, they've had to ease restrictions just for people's just general living. We couldn't stay in level four for yeah. an indefinite amount of time. Therefore, our cases are rising. So I think for New Zealand, it's been quite an interesting shift. Some ways I feel a little bit, even though I work in public health, a little bit unprepared. It's almost like we've watched the pandemic happen in the rest of the world. But we've been very detached from that. We're, in New Zealand, we don't really know what COVID means. We don't know what it means to have COVID in our community and our hospitals and our healthcare systems to be actually at risk of getting it. It's always been a very foreign mm. concept. So the, I think that's going to be a huge shift for in New Zealand, having to learn to live with COVID, which is what many countries were doing a year ago. Well, I think the situation by the sounds of it in New Zealand is similar to what we had, at least here in Sydney, Prior to Delta, we were going for elimination. Once Delta hit, it became very clear that wasn't going to happen. But yeah. because Australia is so large, I mean, Perth, basic, Perth is basically in the same situation that New Zealand was. I don't think they have Delta mm -hmm. over there yet. I say yet because eventually I think it, it will have to happen. But mm -hmm. um, you having to ha film, I mean, j just to recount, so a few days before the, the New Zealand final, you were going to have it in person, then you went into lockdown. Then with the international, obviously it's all virtual, so it's all filming. And for that entire duration, you've been in lockdown. So mm -hmm. how on earth have you been able to create the footage and the videos that you've done? Because, I mean, it, I've got to say, it's, it strikes me as slightly unfair. It's having been on the judging panel um, and I was judging the creative section and you'll see people dancing in these exotic locations and it's, oh, wow. But just to to compare that, you can't you can barely leave the house. So how mm -hmm. how have you found that that facet that struggle? I I think it's been a struggle not only to get it done, but a bit of a struggle mentally. So Miss Earth is something that I've with my heart of hearts, I really want to do well at. And I believe mm -hmm. that given the chance I could do really well as a representative for Miss Earth, whatever position that may be, even if it is 
just continuing my year as Miss Earth New Zealand. I'm over the moon that I had the opportunity. It's something that I know I could do, but given the circumstance, I'm sort of making peace with the fact that maybe I won't be as happy with some of the content that we're making. I'm still absolutely over yeah. the moon with everything I have been able to make. But for example, there's a boundary lockdown around Auckland. So all of my locations have to be within the city. So for mm. prior to lockdown, I was hoping to go to Rotorua to film the volcanic geysers. We wanted to go to our yeah. Great Lakes and show them off. So it's scaling back all of that sort of stuff. And then it's also yeah. the fact that since we didn't have a final night, there's like flow on effects of different organizations that we have on board to help me that not that not necessarily can access me now that we're in lockdown. It's like all these little things that you don't think about until it gets there. For example, I couldn't even go buy eyelashes. <laughs> like, and then so to see the other girls who have full studios, like I'm obviously happy for them, but there's that little part of me that is like, I really wish that could have been my Miss Earth journey. And unfortunately, it hasn't been my Miss Earth journey. It has been sort of scraping things together when I've had the chance to. And I'm still very happy with things turned out. I think I did a pretty good job of hiding the fact that this half of things were oh, made just I, around I my house. I think you did an amazing yeah. <laughs> job. I, I think if anyone not who didn't know the situation in New Zealand, they wouldn't have any idea. I think it's safe to say. Mm. Um, but having been to New Zealand myself, South Island, not North Island, I, I got to agree with you. It's a huge shame because the scenery in New Zealand, I mean, there's a yeah. reason they shot Lord of the Rings there. Yeah. It's second to none. It's yeah. an absolutely yeah. it's, beautiful it's, country. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. And to have a competition mm. like Miss Earth, where the focus is to show yeah. off the most beautiful places you have. And although Auckland does have some really nice spots, just to know that I'm sort of missing out on the ideas that just the vision I had for this competition in my head is just something that's not going to come to fruition. And it also means that a lot of the things that we're doing, I'm my own video editor half the time. The people filming it aren't a professional camera crew. It's my flatmates because I'm not allowed to go outside of my bubble, you know. And then once the lockdowns were loosened a little bit, we're allowed to meet with one other person outside of our bubble, but at a distance. So that means I got a little bit of help with filming, but it's, you know, it's still not in a studio. It still wasn't a sound team. It meant that we had really yeah. tight deadlines with my schedule working as a frontline worker during a pandemic. So if we shot something, realized it wasn't right, it was kind of like, oh, well, we'll just edit it in a way where we can't see that that's not quite right. So it's been a lot of like managing things. I think Miss Earth in general, I, they've been quite fair to us. I think that they will do their best to take into consideration that we're judging the girls, not the video production. But I think an inherent yeah. part of the online competition is that obviously video production is going to come into it. If you have a spectacularly edited, filmed video on high quality equipment, that's going to come off better, even subconsciously, than sometimes me filming on my phone in the park down the road. <laughs> yeah. It It's very difficult. I was judging Miss Earth Australia and I I had to force myself, remind myself that, I'm not judging video production because that is not the pageant. And that, that's not the pageant girl who's doing the video production. That's the team. So I think in many ways, as you said, it does affect you subconsciously. But I think as a judge, I needed to keep reminding myself, even when I was judging Miss mm. Earth, the creative, the, the dancing, um, because you don't, you don't, because you want to judge the girls, the girls, not their video team, because otherwise yeah. it's completely unfair to begin with. I mean, New Zealand is is not exactly a pageant powerhouse yet. Neither no, is Australia, yeah. I have to say. Let's say not on the same level as the Philippines, Venezuela, yeah. or the United yeah. States. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's been um, – and then you work on the front lines as well. So have you have you ever just caught yourself and gone, maybe I bit off a bit more than I could chew this year? Honestly, you must it's, have. it's funny because – I probably out of more so than my friends, I'm someone who absolutely loves doing just a bit of nothing. Like I love it when I can book up a day, book out a day wrong. just to go, what am I going to do today? And just go absolutely <laughs> nothing. I love that. And then for someone who loves nothing, I just keep signing myself up to more and more things. So on top of this, I'm still getting emails from people and then going, oh yeah, I'll do that as well. Yeah, I'll do that. And then I go to bed and I'm like, what am I, what am I doing? <laughs> like, I could be doing nothing. I don't have to be in any of these places. But I think sort of almost like a backhanded sort of compliment that's come to myself in the end is people during lockdown are like oh it's so impressive that you're busy and I'm like yeah, it's my own fault so like I just you have to pick up the things that you've signed up to um and it has kept me busy my flatmates unfortunately some of them due to COVID have lost their jobs um some of them are in the film mm. industry and obviously the film industry can't work so living in a house yeah. where half the people are just 
losing their minds because they've got absolutely nothing to do. I feel a bit guilty complaining, oh, I've got two interviews today and I have to film a video because where they're like, I wish I had one of those things to do this week and I have nothing. I'm like, I'll be grateful. I'll be grateful I've got activities on. <laughs> well, it sounds like you are failing miserably at doing nothing. Are, are you I going know, are you going really to negative. give yourself some time off once this is all done? I mean, you got to hang in there for another couple of weeks and then coming up to Christmas, New Year's, I mean, are you going to give yourself a break? In theory, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to have a whole January where I do nothing. But every year I manage to be doing a something that I didn't know I was going to be doing. <laughs> I think I'm just such a yes person, not in like a, even when I want to say no, I'll say yes. Just in like when someone presents me with an idea that seems interesting, I'm like, yeah, I want to be part of that. What is that like? Let's do it. And it's not till I get there and I'm in an interview at three in the morning that I'm like, oh, perhaps should have researched what this actually meant to be doing <laughs> before I signed up to it. But it's kind of fun. I think there's, it's just such an adventure doing something as wild as an online pageant during a pandemic at three in the morning mm -hmm. during a lockdown in my room, knowing that I start at the VAC center in two hours, you know, like that's, there's something going on there that keeps me going. <laughs> yeah, it's known as caffeine <laughs> and yeah. hope and a prayer probably. <laughs> I don't, I don't like, I understand adrenaline, but the thing is you can't run on adrenaline permanently. At some point you would just become run down. So this whole, um, you're probably quite, you're probably quite grateful. I let you schedule your own interview in with me. You could pick a time that wasn't three yeah. in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm working with daylight. That's something I'm very grateful for because, you know, you can have a good quality camera, but I mean, I don't even have that good of a quality camera. I'm actually on my friend's MacBook because I only have my work laptop because I sat on my MacBook and scratched and smashed the screen. So <laughs> so this is my friend's laptop that they graciously let me borrow. And the camera quality is fine during the day. At three in the morning, it's struggling. Luckily, since my friends worked in film, they took some of the set lights uh, off yeah, of the yeah. stage. They're literally this big and it makes the room boiling hot. And I have two of them burning behind the camera here. So that's how we're filming oh, at three in the morning. Yeah. Right, <laughs> so another right. example during lockdown is that I can't just go to the shop and get a light to sit behind the camera yeah, for ring light. AM interviews. Yeah. You know, like I can't just go pick up those. Or when um, I need a change of costume, I can't just go to the shop and buy a green top for my outfit. You know, like I have to either have a week's notice so I can order it online or just ask my flatmates who has something that broadly fits this brief because I need to use it tomorrow. <laughs> you, you've, <laughs> you're doing well. I got to say, I mean, despite all those challenges and they sound – um, as one of the commenters has placed, uh, I think Siska said, you have very similar challenges with Miss Earth Australia. Yeah, we had lockdowns with five kilometre restrictions. Um, Emily here, I assume someone you know has written, nice ever, she has done amazing, yeah, so that's genuine. Yeah, my friend Emily, she is amazing. There you go. <laughs> and Nam Fon has saying, you're doing such a great job, Eva. Um, I've got to say, despite the struggles that you've had, and they're definite struggles, we're not just making it up to sound like it's harder than it is, um, but I, I've noticed that you've made, and I don't know how you feel about this, with the hot picks. You've you've caught the eye of quite a few of the, um, the mm -hmm. hot picks around the bloggers around the world. How has that felt as, as a Kiwi? And as I've said, you know, New Zealand is not exactly known for being a pageant stronghold, you've competed before and done very well. How does it feel to be noticed as a Kiwi? When I saw the first one, which was the Missisology, that was the first to come out that I was tagged in and they put me as fourth. And I, mm. I, it came out in the middle of the night. I can't remember even why I was up. I think the cat was meowing at me. I've got the cat asleep down here next to me. Um, so I saw it and like I, I got clammy hands. Like it was so overwhelming, that feeling of just being noticed. Um, I think... Another flip side to that is because we're in lockdown, there's part of me that sort of had to make peace with the fact that maybe all my videos aren't exactly how I wanted them to be. Um, yeah. And then so to have people notice me and think, oh, she could be top four. And then for me to submit exactly. videos where I go, this, there is huge restrictions on what I have handed in here. Mm. So I'm happy with what I've done and I've made peace with the fact that wherever I place is where I place. And I know all the struggles that I've had to face and I know that I've done the very, very best I can given the circumstances. It's almost mm. sort of like imagine how well I could do if the circumstances were perfect. Now, the circumstances are never going to be perfect. So that is always going to be that idea that, oh, if I wasn't in lockdown, I probably would have complained. Oh, I wish the weather was better because it's been raining this whole time as well. That's another thing. We're not allowed to film inside. 
because of lockdown, so I had to film outside, and we had a week and a half of thunderstorms. And every morning I'd get up and be like, bikini today? <laughs> no, not today. And then just sit there anxiously waiting for the rain to stop and then go, maybe this afternoon. <laughs> like, it's just all of those sort of things. So, yeah, being noticed, it's amazing. Honestly, it's almost that that's all I do this for is just to have people notice New Zealand. And for Mrs. Yeah. the main comment was that they think I would be a good spokesperson for the, the Miss Earth mm. brand. That's, that's all I want to show the world. I want to show my message that I have and I want a platform to do that and I don't have to win Miss Earth to get that platform I already have that right now for example I'm here in an interview with you and it's and the other thing is that I just want to know that I just want them to see that New Zealand can do things too like we don't have the sash factor but we still send girls who are amazing we have a lot of talent here and the only barrier that we have is that just generally we don't have the funds to do anything big and extravagant yeah. to sort of, of put, like to draw attention to ourselves, I think. So I think for Mrsology and the other ones to have noticed me, that's been a long, slow burn for me. I've been doing patents for a couple of years now. At the start, I knew that I could do something well, but I needed other people to trust that I could do well for their brands. And that's something that you have to work up over time. So I think th the achievement for me was just that people have recognized that, yeah, she could do this. Maybe it won't be her time this year. Maybe it will be my time this year. Maybe Miss Earth will select me as one of their finalists, but regardless, it feels good for me to know that I've finally been recognised as someone who is a good spokesperson who does know what's happening when it comes to pageantry and the advocacies that she's talking about and is truly passionate about what I do this for. I mean, I don't get up at three in the morning for the Instagram followers or so I can say I'm Miss Earth New Zealand. I get up at three in the morning because I want to tell the world what I have to say. Well, I, I have a pageant at work for people that I've built up over the four or five years. And I asked a friend of mine, um, Megan Kenny, I don't know if you know Megan Kenny, um, obviously a New Zealand pageant girl. And I asked her about you and she said, yeah, you, you're amazing. You've done well. So um, she, she said that I should definitely set up the interview. So, uh, and I know that you've competed before. I know that you've won it with Supernatural. I think it was Oceania, you won the Oceania title and mm -hmm. best in interview as well. Yeah. So when it comes to the speaking part of it, and even just watching some of the stuff that you filmed for Miss Earth, it's definitely striking that yes, you you know how to talk and uh, what do you not describe? I can't, <laughs> the words escaping me. It's weekend brain, but you know how to. You're very well spoken. Eloquent, mm. that's the word that I'm using. Um, and your, your advocacy was revolving around politics uh, and how people can get involved. And I think that's very, very interesting. So as a start, can we just talk about how you got passionate about politics? Because I've noticed recently that young people have been getting more and more involved in politics. Mm -hmm. And I think it's partly because they've seen the cost of what happens if they don't get involved in it whether it's with the US elections, whether it's Brexit, climate change. So how did you get, you're only 24, yet you're passionate about politics. How did that happen? Well, I think your statement there is just bang on the money. It's We've seen the consequences if we leave politics up to people who historically have been the ones in charge of it. And mm. I think we've also seen what happens if we just don't demand better. And I, for me, the reason I'm involved with politics is because um, the area that I work in outside of pageantry is um, a lot of policy focus. So I have an inherent connection to policy and politics in that space. But I also work as a Māori health promoter and historically Māori have been marginalised by areas of politics. So I think it's having that fire in my belly of knowing that we just because these people have been elected and put in charge, it doesn't always mean that they're going to do the right thing. Even if they have the best intentions, mm. that doesn't always mean they're going to do the right thing. So there needs to be someone always there holding them accountable. And it also means that we need to be driving other people to be actually listening to what's going on because politics, is, it can be really dry and it can be slow and it can be painful and you can be really passionate about something and then yeah. it doesn't go your way. And then that, that hurts and it's, it's so, so much work for highs and then just the lowest of lows sometimes when things don't come through the way that you think they're going to. So for me, the reason I'm so invested in politics is not everyone can, like you said, not everyone is eloquent, but it doesn't mean they don't know what they want in their life. And so if I mm. can be the person that can, that can advocate that for them, if I have to be the conduit, this is what we say at work all the time, the conduit between policy and community, then I almost feel like I have an obligation to be in that space. Um, an example of this is my dad. He's 
absolutely lovely. <laughs> like I love him more than anything in the world, but in a lot of ways he's been marginalised by society just in general because he wasn't very smart at school. You know, he was in trouble with the law a lot when he's But as someone who's his daughter, I know him better than anyone in the world. I know that he has good ideas. He knows what he wants and what he would need in his life to thrive. And so no one's going to listen to him because I'll write him off, but they'll listen to me. So I have an obligation, yeah. I feel personally, to be that person to enter that space and go, all right, if you're not going to listen to all these other people for whatever your prejudices are, you'll probably listen to me. So now it's my job to speak on behalf of them. Uh, my goal in life would to not be speaking on behalf of people it would be to work with them and give them the resources to represent themselves because obviously that's the optimal way that our societies can thrive mm. but for the meantime working with what we have i genuinely feel like i have an obligation to be in this space how i, I certainly understand what you mean by obligation um because there mm -hmm. aren't many people who can take i guess the the very raw feelings especially for someone who's been ostracized is just it just feels bad but how to actually word it and then put it into policy actually can be extremely difficult so in terms of the future not just with with, with miss earth where do you see your sort of career path taking you in terms of being that voice or being that conduit are there certain career is there a certain career path that you're you're aiming for a certain career trajectory or a dream job um i i'm 24 so i think a lot of people hit this age if they went to university and they had the privilege of studying they've sort of entered mm. the workforce and they're sort of getting a taste for you know it's like when you sign up to your degree you think you want to be a nurse but you've never been a nurse before until you do the job so for me i thought i wanted to be involved with health I wasn't sure where I was lucky enough to do a health science degree, which opens me up to a lot of different areas. From there, I realized I wanted to do policy. Now that I work in a job that's sort of policy and community based, it sort of opens up again. Okay, but what do I want to do with policy? I've as, yeah. as sort of noticed that my talents are sort of telling stories, speaking on behalf of people when they need it, and also telling the stories of others. So that sort of in my mind has thought maybe I could look into journalism in future. That's something I'm definitely considering. Mm -hmm but then also a more sort of direct route from the job that I currently have would just be working into more policy writing space, which is more direct impact. But at the same time of that, I've also been interested in sort of council work and politics in general, maybe even running in politics in the future. So I think yep. being 24 is a confusing time because fortunately I, I'm, I have a lot of opportunities and a lot of different ways I could take my life and it's a little bit scary trying to pick which one to go with. But yeah, so those are sort of the areas in general that I'm looking at at the moment. During the pandemic, I feel like I'm in the right place. So I'm working in community public health. I do policy and a mixture of on the grounds of things. So for example, I'm at the VAC centres helping out there. And I think my plan for the immediate future is to stay and sort of learn in the role that I have. I'm very lucky that I have a job where I learn heaps of different things every single day mm -hmm. so while i'm young and while i'm not sure exactly what i want to do i want to stay here learn as much as i can experience all the different areas that come with being in public health and then sort of refine that as i go forward i think that's that sounds like a sensible choice the mm -hmm. statistic that i've seen i don't know if you've seen the same one but i think on average people will have six to seven full-time careers in their lifetime not not jobs but six to seven mm. full-blown different careers um and i think that statistic came up was about 10 years ago so i can only imagine that's even exploded since then because there are so many different ways you might be passionate about something and have a certain set of gifts but how you actually manifest that into reality there's a lot of choices that um mm. that, that you can make um how how what has life been for you like generally through lockdown because i like to think that we're coming out of it now as you already mentioned new zealand kind of managed to get away from the worst of it but what was life for you like before lockdown and now coming out of it hopefully on the other side what have been some of the struggles and some of the challenges for yourself i think lockdown and COVID in general because I have a passion for Māori health in particular. So for those that might be watching from other parts of the world, Māori are the indigenous people of um, New Zealand. I am Māori myself, most people don't guess that. Um, and so I think it's highlighted a lot of inequities. So in my personal life, I've lived in a flat 
of 12 people. I live in a huge house and they're all doing their very, very best to be quiet right now. And I'm super, super grateful. Um, so if you hear any noises, it's them forgetting that I'm in here. But yeah, so I have a, I have a great setup for lockdown. In all honesty, I have 12 different people in this house with me, including myself. I have my cat here. All of them are loving and caring. We have a mixture of people who are working, some who have lost jobs. And so my day to day during lockdown, I, it's it's been enjoyable. I've lucky that I've had connection. Yeah. I have space. I have people around me who I love and I don't feel lonely. And I also have space to be alone if I do want to be alone. So the actual change in lifestyle for me has been fine. The hardest part for me has been seeing how hard how lockdown and COVID in general has just exacerbated the inequities in New Zealand and our health system that we have already yeah. seen. For example, our vaccination rates with Māori. When the vaccination campaign rolled out, we said we need to take a different approach for vaccinating Māori because Māori have different needs and they have different requirements just because mm. they're just a different culture of people, you know, same with different people all over the world need different things. I personally feel like that wasn't listened to, that wasn't addressed and we were not heard when we were voicing these concerns. Now that Delta has arrived in our shores and there is a push to get vaccinations and Māori have lower rates than other populations in New Zealand, mm. it's almost like people are turning around and going, look, Māori are the problem. Like, well, we said from the start that we need a different approach here. And so the obvious result is that we're going to have differential proportions of and the rest of the population getting vaccinated. In this start, we've been asking to sort of take our own Māori public health in a different direction to serve our people because they have different needs. So that, for me, has made me frustrated. And it once again, just links back to my fire in my belly for policy and politics is that we can't just trust the people who are in charge to always do the right thing, even if they have the best interests or at the time they think they're doing the right mm. thing. We need to be out here voicing our opinions, advocating and, and pressing when we have issues like this. Otherwise, it's going to come up when it's too late, which, in my opinion, is what's happened here. It's actually quite, well, it's very disappointing on a personal note mm -hmm. to hear that because I, I always thought that New Zealand, in terms of the way they treated and integrated with their indigenous Maori culture was far, far beyond, for example, a country like us in Australia and the struggles that we've had. Mm -hmm. We've had similar struggles. I think I, it's just disappointing for me to, to hear that. Um, in, in terms of the inequities that Maori people face in New Zealand, has it, has it been getting better? Have, have the inequities been getting less or has COVID sort of put that back and exacerbated those inequities more? I think, I mean, in certain areas over time, New Zealand, as you said, is a, across the world, sort of a world leader in this space. But mm. as someone who works full-time dedicated it, and also my job is to be dedicated to fixing the issues, it almost makes me a little bit sad to think that because I'm, I'm far from happy from the, with the way that New Zealand handles this. And to think that we're one of the best in the world, that makes me really sad for other cultures around the world for, to think that what yep. they have to deal with if we are one of the leaders. Yep. Um, so I think uh, an easy example of the way that COVID has exacerbated these inequities in New Zealand is that we have what I would call a surprisingly high amount of people who don't have access to the internet. And we call that the digital divide. We have, mm. we have a huge population of people in New Zealand, a huge amount of poverty, which is sort of not very obvious in our culture. It's sort of hidden. And I think it's sort of because it sort of integrates to into a lot of our life. So we have a huge population of Māori in particular who don't have phones, don't have access to the internet. When we enter right. a thing like lockdown, where all of our announcements and all of the locations of interest are listed on a website, mm. How, how are Māori meant to access that if they don't have phones, you know? And it's just mm. little things like that. People were talking about how they're experiencing loneliness during lockdown. Imagine you couldn't even video call your friends because you don't have a phone. Or if you're, yeah. like, for stories that I've heard from community members is they'll be, they'll only have one laptop in the family and they'll have to pick which one of the kids can go to their Zoom lessons today for school. So it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough and it's real and it's out there. And I think a lot of people don't see it because they haven't been exposed to it or they hear the stats and it's so foreign and so unimaginable to think mm. that people living in Auckland don't even have internet, you know, like that's, that's crazy. You can get internet for free down the street at the spark modem that you walk past, you know, like it's, it's quite a yeah. foreign concept, but it is real and it is there. And it's, I know it's easier to ignore it and just to focus on other areas, but not everyone can be as privileged enough to ignore it. 
It, it is very striking to me as an Australian who's worked with more than a few New Zealanders mm -hmm. to hear that is actually very sad because, as you said, I think the rest of the world looks to New Zealand and rightly so as a leader in this in this area and to hear that there's still a, a, a huge divide like that. And then through COVID, I mean, for example, if I want to go to a store, I have to check in with a phone. If I don't have a phone, phone, if I don't have the internet, I'm inherently already at a disadvantage. And we've seen that even with aged people here. Mm -hmm. They might have a phone, but they don't really know how to use it. So then to hear that whole communities might not have a phone, might not have internet access, might only have one laptop, so some of the kids aren't able to attend education, which then will set them gener generationally even further back because they don't have the education. Yeah. That's, um, that's actually really sad to hear. I, I didn't realise it was that bad in New Zealand. Yeah, I think we have a culture of, we really celebrate our wins and rightfully so, but I also think that mm. we don't really know how to address our inequities. And a lot of people when we, for example, when we talk about things as, oh, so what are we going to do to help improve Māori vaccination rates? Um, because Māori have lower vaccination rates. When I was at the Vax Centre yesterday, we were, ha we, open your boot, we'll fill it up with boxes of food. If you come through, we'll mm. make sure you've got kai. For example, one guy came in he was about my age his car wouldn't start when he was it's a drive-through vaccination center so the only way you could get mm. here is in a car anyway also another issue drive-through vaccination centers what if you don't have a car what are we going to do there anyway sorry <laughs> so he was he was his car wouldn't start so we have food vouchers for everyone that comes through i gave him like an extra like, couple oh sorry i didn't give him an extra couple the lady in front of me who was giving those out gave him an extra couple because well, his car's not starting and if he's gonna have to get that fixed soon we want him to at least be able to yeah. eat that week and then people get yeah. upset that why why are maori getting these vouchers and like well because there's more of an incentive to get maori vaccinated we need more support in different areas in maori mm. health when we look at the needs of a community we don't just say oh there's high smoking rates for example let's go in there and like ask people do you want to quit smoking we, we would mm. never really lead with that being the first question the first question is hey how are you have you eaten today yeah what what do you yeah. need what, just in general, yeah. what do you need? And then we can get to that sort of stuff. But in order for us to have you in a healthy environment, it can't just, just be this one specific area. We've got to make sure you're looked after everywhere mm -hmm. else first, you know. And that's just people just in general deserve that. They deserve that respect. If we've got people out there who are hungry, why don't we have drive through centres where they can, can get food? Why would you ever be angry that people are getting food when they need it? You know, like those sort of things. Mm. We've unfortunately seen a lot of that sort of i think selfish behavior throughout COVID, not just in new zealand but around the world but i've always thought that if you're going to really if you genuinely want to help a culture or help another people or help another country you first got to understand them you, you don't just mm -hmm. go in and tell them what they should do without truly understanding their culture because then they won't feel understood they won't feel respected and any change you make is going to be short term or short changed at best because they don't feel like they're understood and especially if they're feeling like everyone else is judging them as less than or as backwards people or whatever it is that only makes that divide worse um i just in in terms of the pageant if you were to win or let's say place um mm -hmm. Just, just my thought process of obviously Miss Earth is a global pageant and it's based heavily on the environment, um, things like climate change, et cetera, which is a huge issue globally. And then obviously there are issues that are very close to your heart, very locally. So mm -hmm. in terms of would you focus more on the local to affect global? Would you focus more top down and look at global first? Or are you trying to split your focus? Have you given any thought to that? I have given quite a bit of thought to this, actually. So I think the way that I've sort of lensed it is that the issues that are faced in New Zealand aren't necessarily just particular to New Zealand, but also mm. the solutions that we can help to work towards in New Zealand also would be beneficial to areas around the world. So a lot of Indigenous cultures like Māori, like others around the world, the, the, the value systems, quite interestingly, interestingly can be quite similar to each other i think one area that is quite intuitive when you think about it is especially in relation to miss earth is that indigenous cultures in general have a greater connection to the lands in which they live and which they've come from mm. so in, like an example in new zealand is that maori are always 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 at the forefront of climate action 
just as an example. So Māori have a deep reverence and respect for the land. They are always looking for ways to protect it and they will they will not prioritise others over the look, looking after the land because they know inherently just because of Māori culture and the way it's set up that mm. looking after our land is one of the top things that we always need to be doing. So I think, sorry, I just had a window pop up. So I think for me, what I'd like to do is highlight the need for listening to Indigenous cultures when it comes to taking care of their land, when it comes to moving forward with climate change and climate action, mm. we need to be looking to the Indigenous peoples of the lands in which it will be affected because in general, just like with COVID, Indigenous groups will be disproportionately affected by climate change. They, they always will be. An example of the Pacific Island nations, for example, is the ocean rises. They, they're they not very yeah. high above the ocean level already. They don't have yeah. 30 years of ocean rising before they start caring about it. They care about it now. You know, mm. and then so I think the platform that I would use Miss Earth for is to not just talk about Maori in particular. I would love to share the word Maori culture though, because you know I'm very proud. Um, but just to reframe this idea that climate change only needs to be tackled from sort of like a science perspective and science being based in Western culture, is that there is mm. a huge wealth of knowledge in Indigenous cultures. They have been living in harmony with their lands for thousands of years before we messed it up yeah. and now we're trying to fix it. You know, they, they know how to look yeah. after it. They know, Māori, for example, know how to read the skies, the winds, the birds. They know what the weather's going to be tomorrow. They can look at the phase of the moon and be like, yeah, this is when we're going to plant stuff and it's going to come out better because we're planting it this week rather than next. You know, all of that sort of inherent knowledge that isn't usually respected in Western culture, we need to be tapping into that. And that is hugely important for a fight for climate action. So I think the thing that I want to do is make sure that policy and Indigenous Indigenous views and knowledge is put at the forefront of my Miss Earth campaign. Well, that's well said. Um, on on the note of politics, has obviously you have a female prime minister, and um, throughout the lockdown, a lot of people have looked up to her and respected her for making some of those sort of tough decisions, particularly early on, as you said with lo uh, with COVID and elimination. Um, how has it felt? How has it impacted you? If it has. Um, having a female prime minister? Well, I think an example that I can think of is sort of prior to COVID, when I was in at Supranational in Poland, a lot of the girls were like, oh, I know Jacinda. And then that just, that was a cool moment for me, being like, yeah, not only do we have like a cool country and a cool prime minister, we have a female cool prime minister. Yeah. She's also just had a baby and also pregnant while she's doing her job. <laughs> like, And she's also handling everything in ways that generally I agree with. So it, it has been quite mm -hmm. cool to, for people to see that in New Zealand, we have some boss ladies going around ruling the show and they're very, very cool. <laughs> I mean, that's not to say that I always inherently agree with all of her political of action, you know, like, but it, it is, it is just so cool to be like, yeah, New Zealand, we're that country where we'll probably have the first woman something. Historically, we yeah. have the first select woman vote. We've had cool woman prime ministers. And so it has been, I don't know, a little bit of motivation for me, a little bit sort of like a, yeah, that's cool. I'm from that place. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm a bit chuffed. I'm a bit stoked with that. Even if country. I, yeah, even if I personally had nothing to do with Jacinda's rise to power, <laughs> like she did that by herself. But I'm going to sit here and be like, yeah, I'm from New Zealand. That's cool. <laughs> like, I love how some of that Kiwi slang is coming out chuffed yeah. and stoked. And you mentioned the spark before. And I'm like, I know what all these mean, but people overseas probably have no idea, no idea. what you're talking no about. It, it's funny to me, though, because, um, I mean, Jacinda, it's on first name basis, but Prime Minister Ardern, obviously a lot of people around the world have, and she's got a lot of press around the world, rightly so. She was having a press conference, and I think there was an earthquake while she had it. And then yeah. after the earthquake sort of subsided, the, the, the reporter asked her, are you okay, Prime Minister? And she just said, oh, yeah, it's okay. It's just a little earthquake. <laughs> just a little earthquake. Yeah, as opposed you get used to, to earthquakes here. <laughs> <laughs> well, as opposed to our Prime Minister when they announced the nuclear submarine deal and um, good old President Biden couldn't even remember the name of our Prime Minister. <laughs> so, oh, no. <laughs> like that lovely guy from down under, it's kind of like it's not a not an yeah. exact level playing field. Um, on, a, on a lighter note, have you ever, obviously you competed internationally at Supranational in Poland. Do they ever confuse New Zealand with Australia? I, I know I mentioned Meg and she says what, what, what annoys you guys is when they just, when they just say, oh, yeah, you're the one next to Australia. So they reference yeah. New Zealand 
it, it, they only know New Zealand. Oh, it's the one next to Australia, which is kind of how I look at Tasmania. It's like that little bit. <laughs> but this, Wait, other Tasmanian. Yeah, like... Exactly. Yeah, the bigger Tasmania. Has that ever happened to you? Um, yeah, a little bit. And well, actually, in Poland, my my very very best friend, I got paired in a room with Miss Australia, and they did that because they're like you guys are not going to be sleeping at the right time. So at least you can be waking up each other and not someone else. <laughs> like, which ended right. up being great because they're more roommates. But uh, on the flip side to that, something that's always sort of troubled me a little bit is that we were the only two competing for the Oceania crown and only one of us could take that home. And that yeah. never feels good to be competing against, you know, your very best yeah. friend in the competition. I think mm -hmm. that's sort of like a weird element to it. But yeah, we, oh, we, we would lean into it. We, I would purposely sometimes speak in Australian accent and she'd speak with the New Zealand one just to confuse the others. And they'd be like, <laughs> oh, which one is, like, what accent is that? And they'd be like, yeah, mate, yeah, it's all good. You know, like, just, that wasn't a very good example. But, you know, we would just start, like, leaning into bad. it. Or, that that or wasn't if, bad. <laughs> or we'd just start speaking in so much slang that literally no one else could decode it. Just, they have no idea what's going on. <laughs> like, that that Aussie impersonation was a lot better than most of the Aussie accents I've been given. But believe me, I've had people from South Africa to the UK to Ireland, America, all try to do Australian accents, and they all come up with, oh, crikey, mate, there's a shark in the water. And I'm just like, oh, God, please not. Well, I think my problem is inherently when I start trying to do an Australian accent, I can't do it without swearing. <laughs> You, you know, all, all without though. throwing in the little, you know, some whistles every few seconds. Like, my yeah. mum actually lives in Australia. She's in Brisbane currently. But prior to that, she all was right. in Rockhampton. And, you know, up in Rocky, she would call me and she'd be like, Eva, guess what they do here for fun? And I was like, what? And she's like, they go to, like, the rodeo. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's different. And then she's like, yeah, it's like cowboys uh, up here. And then so, like, yeah. she would always, I think because of that little bit bogan, she'd always be swearing when she's doing her Australian accent. <laughs> That's not an Australian thing, though. That's a Queenslander thing. That's very, yeah. very different. <laughs> They're telling, yeah, Sydney and Melbourne, I've never seen a rodeo. In Queensland, I can imagine <laughs> it. But, you know, Queensland, I look, I look, I used to live on the Gold Coast, so, you know, I do love it up there. The weather is just amazing. But Queenslanders are a bit of a different breed to the rest of us. Of you know, I feel and, like the equivalent to that is sort of like, Auckland in general is like, you know, it's a big area. People write it off as one, but it's got quite different personalities. That's like mm. West Auckland. West Auckland, bit bogan. We love them. I live in a flat full of Westies. Absolutely love Westies. But there's just like a certain personality that comes with it. <laughs> I, I remember when I was working with all the New Zealanders, a few of them came from Dunedin. What, what, what's the stereotype with people from Dunedin? Is there a stereotype? Well, Dunedin is a student city, so there's not a huge population of people who live and work there. There's a big university there and a majority, I think, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but a huge population of the city is students. And the culture right. there is just it's just out the gate. I'm not sure if that's New Zealand slang or not. But um, so it's like huge drinking culture, messy, falling apart housing that like, you know, you touch the wall and it's just a bit wet for some reason and nobody really knows why. And you just go, yeah, it's fine. It's student flat. Yeah. So the culture from Dunedin is just party hard. It's freezing and we're just going to ignore it because we can't afford a heater. Like, <laughs> just very, very poor student living, you know, in all honesty, not good enough on the landlord's point of view. But I think sometimes okay. the students are like, that's part of the fun. I think that's, yeah, I had definitely had my student days. We had a house that, they didn't build a foundation on it and it was about 100 years old my flatmate at the time he's an architect he crawled under it to see what was going on and then came back out covered in dust he's like the house doesn't have a foundation it's just built straight on the dirt which meant that the whole thing was just like slowly tilting to one side i was lucky because i was on the uphill side of the house so i was fine i just angled my bed downwards my head was above my feet when i slept didn't even notice it the poor bottom half of the house flatmates they would wake up dizzy like they're on a ship one time the floor fell through and we had slugs coming just straight up into the carpet just it was just carpet on dirt and then we're like what is going on here and, like, uh, and then the bathroom fell through one time and they got us just a portal shower in the car park and they're just like there you go there you go and then i'm like okay at least i'm getting my money's worth for my student experience of just being like this isn't oh. good enough, but what else are we going to do? 
You see, when I hear something like that, that actually sounds like the quintessential Aussie experience. I'm like, I oh, should be right, mate. It's like, what's the yeah, worst that can happen? Like, you know, the house is yeah. sinking. It's all good. You know, it's slowly. Sw- oh, dear. That's. Um, you, just, you just get used to just being a bit like this. It's all good. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I guess oh. if it's as long as you're on the higher part, then you're going to think every day I'm. Yeah, tall. you've literally got the I'm higher tall. ground. And then you're just like, this is nice. I'm the cool flat mate now. Just. <laughs> Me. Hey everyone down here, how uh, are we? <laughs> down under no longer. Um, do, 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 I just want to, the, the Aussie New Zealand thing, is it a thing that you, you New Zealanders that we steal all the things from you? Pavlova, Russell Crowe, is that really a big thing? Because okay, I think I, it should be. I, I'm a old boss, used to know Russell Crowe, I think they're related. Fun fact, because um, mm-hmm. New Zealand's very, very small. I think that the stealing New Zealand stuff is sort of an older New Zealander culture. Right, and okay. I don't want to get cancelled for saying that, but, like, have Pavlova <laughs> and gum boots and stuff, I feel like people my age are just kind of like, I don't wear gum boots, so, like, you can have it, I guess, you know, <laughs> like, um, but, like, my mum's generation, and my mum isn't very old, she's only in her early 40s, um, yeah. you know, they, they are furious about that sort of thing. Like, I can, she <laughs> eats pavlova in Australia and she'll send me a photo of it and be like, this is from New Zealand, they said it's Australian pavlova, this is New Zealand, and I'll be like, mum, it's fine, like, I think we can share it, we can share it. I think I'll describe the Australia-New Zealand relationship for people from the rest of the world because I think it is sort of a quite unique relationship you know a lot mm. of, most people have a lot of tension over their borders I would say New Zealand and Australia we're like a brother and sister you know like yeah. we can talk trash yeah. about each other and when it comes to sports we're going to beat you and there's not a chance that we're ever going to let you win because you guys suck you know but if someone else <laughs> were to say something <laughs> bad about Australia as a New Zealander I'll be like yeah you're not allowed to say that yeah. that's my friend no, only no, i'm no, allowed to say like that this. you're not allowed to say that yeah yeah we're but, allowed to say it because we're actually mates but no one else is allowed to say it because you know only we're allowed to bully each other <laughs> well the, the sporting thing is funny because i don't remember the last time new zealand beat australian cricket but then i also can't remember the last time australia beat new zealand at rugby like it's just it yeah. are there any sports yeah. that are kind of close it seems to me very lopsided i don't know maybe like Badminton? I don't know. I don't keep up with it. <laughs> Badminton. Pageantry? Okay. We could do pageantry. Yeah. You know, I think Australia and New Zealand quite often, every couple of years, that we have some real standouts. Both countries do have the capacity to send really good mm. delegates, you know, and then the only barrier generally is the financial backing, you know, like that sort yeah. of stuff. But I think in terms of pageantry, we're quite on tier. I've seen some really, really good candidates come out of Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Well, there you go. We, we figured that out. Uh, now, just before we go <laughs> to the final 10 questions, um, I'll just circle around to the comments for a sec. Emily has said, so genuine and real. And Namfron has said, she penetrates the screen in her speech. In other words, very well spoken. And I don't know how to pronounce this, so I'm not going to try, but go, Eva. Um, that's my uncle. <laughs> Uncle Mai, we just call him Uncle Mai. He's cute as, and we love him. <laughs> okay, because for a second I was looking at that, and I work with a lot of Irish people, and it looked strangely like an Irish kind of spelling, where oh, my yeah. my my housemate, um, my podcast co-host, her housemate's name is spelt C A O I M H E, and somehow that's Kiva. Yeah. And then oh. N-I-M-H-E is Neve. So I looked at that and was like, is that Irish? Anyway. Yeah. No, that's that's Uncle Mai. He's lovely. I had a girl like that at my school. Her name was Anya. And then, you know, in my younger years, I could never figure out how A-I-N-E was Anya. But I believe her name was Welsh. And now that I'm old, I'm like, oh, it's Welsh. That makes sense. But as a kid, I was just like, how is everyone getting this from the name? Like, is this just me not understanding the vowels here? Like I thought I had a pretty good grip on vowels and I'm throwing. So that caused a mini crisis at the age of 11. <laughs> I think as a child, I was like, you spelt your name wrong. That, that shows you what sort of child I was. It's like, that's not how you spell it. You're your- wrong. I know <laughs> yeah, it's your name, exactly. but you're, I'm right. <laughs> like- <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We, you know, we, we all grow a little bit wiser with you, age. You grow, you grow a bit um, wiser. <laughs> And Siska has said, you're lovely, Eva. Okay, oh. Eva, just before we go to the final 10, anyone that you want to give a shout-out to? 
Oh, give a shout out to Emily who's watching. So Emily, we used to compete in pageants together. Since then, she has moved on to bodybuilding and she is amazing at that. She did her first competition a couple of days ago and she got two silvers at her very, very first competition. And oh, I could wow. not be more proud of her than that anything in the world so shout out to emily also to nan fon who's watching um nan fon helps me in my pageant journey in new zealand she's sort of like my management here in new zealand for miss earth she's also the one who has to stay up till three in the morning with me so we are we are sisters in that right of being up at hours that no one should be up at <laughs> uh -huh. and then also shout out to my flat who are very patiently being very very quiet tiptoeing around the house right now for me i really appreciate them Let's go to the final 10 so we can let your flatmates back out into the wild. Um, okay, final 10 questions. Here we go. Rant. I finish every interview with the same question. So here we go. Number one, what's your favourite word? My favourite word. I'm quite liking worm at the moment. Worm. Worm. I think it's we, – we were watching – no, I remember. Okay, so I have, sorry, I don't know if this is meant to be quick fire questions, but I have a story to tell. So I, you know how everyone sort of signs up to like a challenge during lockdown and they're usually like do yeah. 30 squats a day or like get your steps out. Mm. I made up my own um, and it was I have to make a SpongeBob reference of the day every single day, like a meme, like a SpongeBob reference of the day. And then um, <laughs> one of the ones that somehow came up quite often was i'm not sure if you're a spongebob fan the episode where there's the alaskan bullworm and they're going to push the city somewhere else the infamous um patrick quote and then so i've just been walking around going alaskan bullworm and i've quite enjoyed saying worm <laughs> so that is not well, worm, but you were... worm i can do some asmr of worm oh worm. it's right in my ear as well <laughs> worm <laughs> There you go. <laughs> People pay good money for that. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, when you, I don't. But um, when when you said worm and you were saying um, you're going to tell a story and you had a challenge, I thought you were going to say like dancing the worm. That's I, I didn't think it was going to be a SpongeBob SquarePants, but I thought like doing the worm on the floor. You do one <laughs> one day, next day you got to do two, and the next day you got to do three. It's like okay. Not spun. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I don't. I don't know theory. if that's any more sensible than a SpongeBob reference of the day. I have no idea. No. I, don't know how to, I don't know how to calibrate that to, you know, measure them against each other. Well, I don't know. But by the sounds of it, you were in your old house and you did the worm, you'd go right through the floor. So probably the yeah, SpongeBob yeah, SquarePants. And you're is... slightly to the left all the time. Like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. You have just a glass of water and just notice that it's all spilling out the side I, I all the my, time. I had my perfumes on my um, mantle and then they'd always, the water level would always be a bit like this. And it was just like a little subtle reminder that, like, your house isn't quite right, but just ignore it. <laughs> It'd be one of those things, like if you had a couple of drinks, you wouldn't be sure whether it was the drinks or whether it was the house. Or whether it's you. What? Yeah. Yeah. We, we were used to it, but guests would always be like, oh, I think I've only had one, but I'm going to stop. And we'd be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> You've been walking a bit funny. Are you okay? You know, like, drop some water. <laughs> That might be a cure for people who drink too much is go and sabotage their house, get rid of the foundation, their house tilts, and they'll be like, oh, too much, the whole house is on a tilt, better stop <laughs> Yeah, that's actually a really good idea. Okay. I'll write that one down for my next public health campaign. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so that was question one. What your favourite word? Question two, what's your least favourite word? Wasp, but not just wasp, but... You know, when you try to say more than one wasp, I always put too many psps wasps at the end. So I have a, like, I, I try and I try, but all I can say is wasps. Psps, 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 and then the cat comes over because I'm going psps, 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 at him. Yeah. So just say wasps. What happens? Wasp, wasps. Wasps. Psps, like, there's an extra psps, psps, psps that doesn't need to be there. And it's just like, and then I have to count in my head wasps. Psps, and then I'm like, was that still too many? I don't know. <laughs> like, that is definitely a, well. You're, you're two for two in terms of your answers. I've never had either answer. I've not had worm and I've not had wasps. Pss, pss, pss. All right, let's see if we can keep going. Have ten unique answers. We'll see. Okay, question three. In life, what gets you excited or what turns you on? Opportunity. Just just the opportunity to do something new, something different, or maybe something that I didn't think I was going to be doing. For example, pageantry when I was the when I was 19, I had absolutely no idea that this is something that was going to consume my life for the next four or five years. 
and it's exciting when I get a DM from example someone like you being like let's have an interview I'm like oh yes let's do that that's exciting so yeah for me opportunity and the feeling of just like sort of limitless possibilities in life uh, I don't like feeling constrained I think for me that's kind of something about lockdown mm. that really gets to me is I sort of know how my next week's going to go because I don't have a lot of opportunities to get out there and do anything else. So just yeah. something something new in my life, a, a random email from a business going, hey, I saw you doing this. And I'm like, oh, what's this about? Like, mm. I, I absolutely love that. Something something new, something exciting, meeting new people, just opportunity in general. Perfect. Okay, that was what turns you on. Question four is what turns you off? In what context? I don't know. Just um, in general. Just in general, uh, like like a windy day, inclement weather. <laughs> I, I've got a fringe, and a, and a fringe is just not like I can see it's not cloth linen. It's a little bit more hairspray. A fringe is just not a hairstyle to have in a place with any sort of movement in the air around you. It gets a little bit of water in it and it looks sweaty. The wind blows it, and because I hairspray it, I've been literally out on the street, and the hairspray has held it so firmly that when the wind catches it, it sort of catches it as a unit, and then it sort of <laughs> flips up and waves in the wind as like a like so almost it's like, like the bonnet of a car. Yeah, yeah, it's like oh. a spoiler. It helps me like stick to the footpath. Yeah, so inclement weather. <laughs> Don't like it. Don't like a cloudy, white, rainy, windy day, especially the wind. It just you catch me outside waiting for the bus, and it's windy. I'll just be like making this face the whole time, just kind of like, uh, is it worth leaving the house? Should I just quit my job and go back inside? It's a bit windy today. <laughs> yeah. Dear me. Okay. Question five: What sound or noise do you love? The sound of my cat purring, and when he does that little burp noise when he sees me, because he he doesn't. He doesn't meow a lot. He's one of those like quite quiet cats. So when he does mm -hmm. meow to see me, I'm like, oh, I'm special. Thank you, bud. So I absolutely love the sound of my cat just being happy and content because I'm a huge cat lover. And sometimes I cry when I stress about thinking about the fact that there's some unhappy kitties in the world. So just having one cat right in front of me that I know is just content, it's just I'm over the moon with that, over the moon. Well, that's an answer that I would share with you. I'm very much a cat person and hearing he, my one is uh, part ragdoll, so I can just pick him up oh. and sling him over my shoulder and, and he, he's got and no he bones. Just does the, he yeah, just, yeah. The, just, jelly. just earlier today I was holding him upside down and he was just like <laughs> lying back and it's like, this is not normal. You're not supposed to do that. Um, yeah, but he's just kind of like, where are we going? No. What are we doing? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, can you hear me? Yes, sounds back. Yeah. He was um he just has complete trust. Do you know what a blep is? Talking about cats. A blep. Another one of these. I had no when idea. When you're like looking at the paw, it went if, if you want if you want them to do it, I've got a technique. You wait for them to be licking their paw. And then you sort of like make like a crunchy packet that's noise. That's right. Maybe some chippies. And then they Oh don't. my god, that's so because they're kinda like, so oh, accurate. what's that? Yeah. So you know yeah. the planet, I'm a bit of a cat photographer. I have a thousand photos of my cat just like in portrait mode where he's like very grand and very like aloof. And if you want to get a blip, you're going to wait for them to be busy and then distract them. So they do like that thing and it's really cute. I, I'm not a cat photographer. I did put my cat on TikTok. I had him sitting on his backside and I was making him do We Will Rock You and clapping his front <laughs> paws. He wasn't enjoying it very much. So by the third refrain, he leant back and bit me on my chin. Oh, no. <laughs> I, to, that, I, I, can, to... I don't want to be part of this. Like, yeah, I've recently had yeah. to start making TikToks for Miss Earth. Part of the requirements is that we make like, I think it's eight or so TikToks. It mm -hmm. makes me feel old. I accidentally made one and I like added all my plant videos because I was showing people how to plant mm. dill and luckily my flatmates are here to help me coach me through planting dill because I'm not, I do not have a green finger, even if that video would have you believe I know what's going on. So I'm there <laughs> pretending to know what dill is and then I was adding all my videos and you, I'm sure you would know it automatically syncs it to like a suggested song. Yes. Yeah, it came up with some like I think it was like Megan the Stallion or something, and I, I, I love Megan the Stallion. I love Megan the Stallion. So I was ready for it. Yeah, 
but it's just these plants just like busting it down and I didn't know how to get it to stop and then I had to go find my flatmates of like I have plants dancing to Megan and I don't know why it's doing this and I have I uploaded this can people see my plant trap video <laughs> so yeah that's been probably another struggle with Miss Earth is just having to not learn how to use TikTok. TikTok yeah and then when I woke up the next morning I wasn't TikTok famous and I was really offended I was like it, oh no me. you you yeah, you I've, missed I've the whole Insta TikTok famous thing. Yeah, that that was about at the beginning of lockdown. The, mm. Like the very first video I did with zero followers, at, and it was a pageant video. It had like 2,000, 3,000 views. And then I made one TikTok. This was back just before lockdown hit. And the very Australian one, I left, I was with a friend of mine at the beach and I left my phone up there just filming us because we were being idiots in the water. And a seagull comes along comes right, goes right in front of the camera, looks at it, and then just keeps going along. And that that TikTok got like almost 400,000 views. Now, like all the followers yeah. that I have on TikTok are from that one seagull video. The problem now is they're not interested in pageantry. They followed me because they want to see more seagull I want, videos. I want seagull content, you know. <laughs> like, exactly. You have to give the people what they want. Have you seen that video of that seagull that eats a whole packet of frankfurters, like little sausages, and then he just one by one just like throws them up. It's really good. <laughs> it's really good video you should find it and upload that to your tiktok because <laughs> it throws them up whole and they're like a projectile but they are off in the distance i'm like wow that is amazing <laughs> a little girl can do that that's, that's amazing uh, that's, that's a visual i i really want to see that okay yeah i'll send you I know what i'm doing a link after i'll post yes, it in the comments do. of this video for anyone else who wants to see the seagull from, from throwing up the whole frank <laughs> Uh, we've talked about a lot of different things in this interview. Um, speaking of, so that was what was your what's your favorite sound? That was your cat. Mm -hmm. So, what sound or noise do you hate? We, when I was growing up, we had one of those kettles that my mum thought it was kind of like cute and quaint for us to get a kettle that goes on the stove, and then it makes yeah. the. This is actually a hidden talent of mine. It makes the <laughs> noise. But she would always put it on and then go to her room to start doing her makeup and then just would just hear it going off and just wouldn't do anything about it. She'd just be like, oh, tea's ready. I'll just I'll just take my time getting around to that. So I'd be in my room, you know, like grumpy teenagers as we all are, just like moody, probably with the curtains pulled on my phone like this close, just getting frustrated and like, are you making a tea or not? Can you take it off the stove? And then I'll have to walk out there and then take it off. And then she'd come back in 10 minutes and be like, Ah, oh, I was making a tea. It's cold now. Like, well, you weren't making a tea. You were just letting it scream. So that teapot noise, I, I can't, I can't handle it. I absolutely disdain. <laughs> I don't think many people would actually know what that sounds like anymore because most people don't have those sorts of kettle. kettles. Yeah, just one little uh, thing. Yeah, we, she, we she need to brought back up. it for the fact that it was sort of like old fashioned, and then like we quite soon remembered why you know technology mm. evolves over time and often it's because improvements are also made over time and you didn't just have to let it scream at you it just yeah. clicked off politely and says i'm ready as opposed to being like ah <laughs> like, yeah we need to back up for a second talk about this kettle impersonation that you do how, how did you is this a sport in new zealand that i wasn't aware of kettle impersonating uh well, kind of so i know how to do it because um, my mum grew up on a sheep farm and she can do that dog whistle that sheep whistle that's on the top of the roof of your mouth so it's not with your lips it's with the roof of your mouth i for life of me can't do it but by accident when i was trying to like fine tune my dog whistle noise i came across the fact that i can do this which has absolutely no utility unless i'm telling the story about the time my mum didn't get up to get the kettle but you know i hold it close to my chest in case that story ever comes up and then i'll be like oh now's my moment now's my moment Time no, to look no, up I know you, you. You have a big future as an alarm clock. Mm. I mean that that'd wake anyone up. So if anyone needs yeah. a human alarm clock, you're up. I would be have a great future as an alarm clock if I also had the capacity to be awake to wake them up. But I would probably also be asleep, being like, "Oh, I'm in charge of us waking up." Oh, just not today. We'll both just sleep. It's just both. 
I've, I've never met out. anyone who was able to do a kettle impersonation. But I've never met anyone who impersonated a kettle before. But... Yeah, we had the want and or need to impersonate a kettle, I think, is the real focus here. Oh, that's um, that's a very niche market and that's very unique to you. Okay, question seven. If you could have any one superpower, apart from impersonating a kettle, what would it be and why? You know, I think during COVID, especially one that I wish I could do is travel. I wish I could just sit through mm. borders. I will I will get my pre-departure COVID test and I will have my day yeah. nine COVID test before I see other people. But <laughs> if I could just, you know, cross borders, go home, see my family. Um, also, the price of gas in New Zealand is insane. If I could not have to pay for gas, I would really, really love that. And if I could wake up about 30 seconds before I needed to be somewhere and then just be there. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I would love to be able to teleport, but I'd also abuse it. Like I, I wouldn't even like walk to the kitchen anymore. I'd like teleport to the kitchen, teleport back. <laughs> yeah. You guys say gas? I didn't realize this. This is news to me. Kiwi say gas, not fuel or petrol. We, I think in general, we say gas. Um, if you said fuel oh, wow. or petrol in conversation, I think yeah. it would sound, it would sound really natural. People wouldn't pick up on it, but I think yeah. the general world is got to get gas, get some gas, get some gas. Oh, wow. No one says that. No one says that. Yeah, that that get, get some Gaza doesn't know. Um, how just out of interest, how much is is Gaza at the moment for you guys? Oh yeah, oh Gaza ninety one Gaza. He's about um about two eighty, two sixty. Last time I checked. Oh it's, yeah, yeah. It's it's, yes. it's craziness. And then so people will be like, oh, because we're allowed to meet like one person outside with our lockdown restrictions at the moment, which yeah. honestly feels like the world, you know, to us because we're used yeah. to just being you're inside, nothing else. Um, they'll be like, should we meet at like a West Coast beach or something? And then I'll be like, no, because that's a lot of money to drive far. And we, um, we also have to take our own cars there and our own cars back because we're not allowed to be in the same car yeah, together. Of course. So we're yeah. just like, how about some local anyway? So I, I a secret conspiracy that instead of putting sort of like a radius around people, just make gas really expensive, can't afford to go anywhere anyway. Just That's can't a afford lot to more go than... more than five gas. I thought it was expensive here and it was about a dollar eighty, two dollars eighty. That's I That's... I remember when was it two dollars? I remember when gas got over, I think it was two dollars. I, 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 when I was a little kid, it might have even been one dollar, but I can't quite remember now. But when it sort of hit that threshold, I remember my mm. nana being like, "We're gonna have to sell the car. We just simply can't afford it. We're gonna sell the car. We're all getting bus cards and like f flitting around, like stressing and being like a dollar ten. Oh. And then and then it hit a dollar ten, and then nothing happened. We're still just like." probably still just going to fill up the car with gas but like you know there was a moment there where everyone was getting e-bikes <laughs> probably would have been better for the planet yeah and then everyone remembered the inconvenience of that and decided to still go with gas but just to come back to my policy point only because New Zealand doesn't have infrastructure built around public transport and safer public transport systems which is why mm. we still pay $2.80 for gas if we had good public transport no one no one would do that no one wants to pay for that Jeez, that, 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 that is a lot. Okay. Yeah, that's I think painful. it just highlights the extent of our public transport situation that people were paying. The other day I put $25 in because my gas light came on and then I got back in my car and my gas light was still on. And I was like, I just put gas in <laughs> for my light to go off and my light is still on. It's like your car is dying of thirst and you gave it a little thimble of water. Yeah, and and it's and like, 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 that's going. enough. Drink, that. drink. Yeah. Now take me home. Come yeah. on. <laughs> uh, I, I'm losing track. Question eight. Sorry. What job Sorry, or occupation? No. No, I, I, it's fun because I interviewed Miss Earth Australia the other day. Now I'm interviewing you. And it's like the thing that I do love about interviewing people from Australia and New Zealand is you can just have a laugh. You don't have yeah. to take things too serious. So you can obviously talk about serious issues as we have. But then we're also not uptight and take ourselves too seriously. And it's lovely. It's just so relaxing. I think um, we just can't probably, afford to take ourselves too seriously around here. <laughs> it's probably one of my biggest pet peeves as someone who takes themselves ultra seriously. I, I, I respect people who take what they do seriously, mm -hmm. but someone who takes themselves seriously, they need to sort of, you know, need to make fun of them yeah. a little bit. Just, just to, uh, chill a little bit. It's all good. It's all good. Oh, that's, an, that's another New Zealand thing. Is it chill pill? Do you guys still say pill. that? Um, yeah. 
No. <laughs> oh, okay. Take a chill pill. <laughs> like, I think if my mum said take a chill pill, I'd be like, what? <laughs> like, like, what are we talking about there? Yeah. Like, she'll tell yeah, me to chillax. Okay. We'll chillax and I'll happily chillax. I'll be like, yeah, all right, let's do some chillaxing. One thing that I've been doing lately is, um, like really really badly and consistently confusing the word leisure with liaise and then so I keep telling my friends well let's go to the park you know trying to say something along the lines of like let's let's have some leisure time and I'm like let's liaise at the park and they're like oh we're gonna go network and I'm like sorry not not liaise <laughs> didn't mean to say that <laughs> you're getting so- <laughs> yeah they don't they don't mean they begin with the same syllable but not yeah, like le- but- le- Ah, because you say leisure. All right. Leisure. I say leisure. You say leisure. I, I think Leisures. most people say leisure as well, but I quite enjoy leisure, you know, a lady of leisure. <laughs> we better wrap up this interview yes. before your fat mates kill us. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's Next go through these really, last three questions. Fast. All right. Question eight. What job or occupation other than your own would you most like to attempt? Um, I would love to be a journalist. I would love to tell stories. I'd love to create things. I'd like to work on a project start to finish. I'd like to do the editing. I'd like to do the filming. I'd like to do the writing. I want to do, I want to do everything and everything that comes with telling a story. So, yeah, I'd love to be a journalist. Maybe YouTube would be a good career for me because yeah. I'd be someone who's in charge of telling a whole story start to finish. Question nine, what job would you definitely not like to attempt? Uh, something where I had to... Like swim. <laughs> I was like, where is she going with this? <laughs> this is the crabs. <laughs> and also, in case it wasn't obvious, I can't swim. <laughs> because this is, this is all what think? I do in the water. I'm not surprised you can't swim if this is how you were trying. <laughs> for me in the water, I'm just like, oh, oh, I can't breathe. You know, like, that's it's not for me. I'm not a swimmer. Um, neither is my dad, although, and actually I'm going to say this because I know that he will be stoked for it to be, you know, on international news. He won the, um, I believe it was the meth in primary school starfish competition, um, back in the day. And he <laughs> holds on to that because he said he got the record. Like everyone else had long given up and been like, okay, Grant, mm. you can get out of the pool now. And he's like, no, nah, I'm going for the record. I'm going to stay here no, all mate. day if I have I to. So here. my dad holds the record for starfishing, but yeah, we're not summers. We're not summers. I, when you started doing this, I was like, not uh, something that doesn't involve my hands, like baking, yeah. like no swimming. Like, how, how, if we were doing like miming, I, I would never have guessed in a million years this was. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, like trades. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, uh, uh, yeah. talking? You know, Conversa- uh, anyway. Conversation, crabs. Yeah. Cancer, mm-hmm. you know? Not swimming. Not no. swimming. No, Any- I wouldn't be a good, very good lifeguard. Um, I, yeah, just not a good swimmer. Don't like getting wet, um, in the ocean. Like it just sort of, just none of it's really about me, you know. But love, okay. love the ocean. Love lakes and rivers. Love visiting them. Love being at the beach. And then I but go, not being oh, I'm gonna in get, them. and then I go, oh, I'm gonna get in the water. And I get there, and it's like salty and sticky, and there's something touching my foot, and I'm like, it's just not for me. It's just not for sticky. me. <laughs> Why is your know. water sticky? I don't know, and that's why I don't want to be in it. Why is it sticky? Why is it sticky? What are nice. these guys doing that your water is sticky at the beach? I don't know. <laughs> Just like... You sure this is the water you're going in? You haven't gone into someone, some I don't know, behind a boat or something? I don't know. Maybe New Zealand's water just has like a really quite firm surface tension. Like we've just got, yeah, I don't know, something about it. Have... It's the could gravity have. at the bottom of the earth. Causing the surface tension just to be a bit stronger. Based in science, I have a science degree. (laughs) Final question, and we're never going to finish this otherwise. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Welcome to the kitty room. And then you just walk in there, and there's just every kitty that's ever lived. And then I go, thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll take my ticket. And then I walk in and there's just lots of cuddly cats. I'd Done. like that. Yeah, it'd be so nice. I'd and they're be. all cuddly and they're all well fed. They've got full bellies, giddies with full bellies, and they're all purring and they're like a bit sleepy. Your, your aunt is actually exactly the same as uh, Marissa's Miss Earth USA, except she wants the dogs. So you want the cats. She wants the yeah, dogs. Yeah, I'll put the cats. 
if you can go in the doggy the doggy room you know maybe doggy park probably they're probably like the park cats like being like somewhere warm so i'm gonna say it's a room yeah there was a funny tiktok i put up the other day about the difference between cat people and dog people and i think they said that dog people wish their dogs were people and cat cat people wish they were a cat like cat people wish they were a cat they had a cat's life Oh, I, I remember when I was younger, like I said, like I always used to think like if I could come back in another life, you know, if you can come back as something else. Like as a cat. Guy, I want to come back as a cat for like a really, really rich, like possibly a bit camp couple. Yeah. You know, like I, I want yeah. I want a, I want a kitty bed that's also a castle that's also got like an elevator or something like like a bit camp. And I, I would thrive. That's what I that's what I want in life. You know, I want I want to be dressed up as like. Like big goggles, a little bow, you know, maybe paint my little kitty nails or something. I'm just imagining I could take so many clips from this interview and just take them out of context and put them up and people would have no idea yeah. what on earth you're talking about. Oh, we'd let them wonder. A little bit of mystery. That's me. Just always come with oh, I gotta have mystery. a Gotta have a little bit of fun. Uh, anyway, just before we wrap up, let me circle back to the comments one last time. Chelsea here has said, ha, 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 OMG, Eva, you are hilarious. Thanks, Chelsea. <laughs> and she's also said, worm. Worm, yeah, worm, <laughs> worm. worm. Oh, dear. That that sound is going, that word's going to give me nightmares. Hey. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Don't watch anyway. June. Don't watch June if you're not into worms. Who's into worms? I'm kind of into worms. When we did our Miss Earth planting day, um, I couldn't, for the life of me, and this is going to sound a bit pathetic, I couldn't dig the hole. And I remember being like, oh, it's been a dry heat. You know, it's a very dry heat. The the, the soil is going to just be rock hard. And then I talked mm. to someone about it, and they're like, no, this is like, this is like soft clay. And I'm like, oh, so it's just me. Okay, it's just me. All right, so I get back out there trying to dig it. And then I found a bunch of worms. And then I had a little mini worm pageant, Miss Worm. And I got my little worms and I lined them up. And then I drew a circle around them. And I think this is illegal in some countries, but I just waited for the first one to get out of the circle. And it was like a little little race for my worm friends. I quite like them. Well... You I don't, don't know what we're talking about at this point, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's been fun. Thanks. <laughs> this is a unique, an interview that I will remember for the rest of my life. So uh, thank you for coming on, and um, best of luck in all seriousness with the, with the rest of the pageant. Yes, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm, I, you know, I might not have had everything work out for me in the easiest way possible, but I'm really proud of what I've done. And especially, especially yeah. my eco video that's coming out this week. Um, if people don't watch anything else that I put out there, that's something that I'm super proud of. Um, the message in it is really, really important to me. So yeah, that's, that's something I can be super proud of regardless of what Miss Earth turns out to be for me. I'm so stoked that I got to put that out there for Miss Earth. Perfect. Well, when that does come out, tag me in it and I'll yep. be happy to share it for you. Help put oh, New Zealand so on the map. I will keep you on the line for just a second whilst I hang up with the audience. But thanks everyone for watching, whether it's live or on the replay. And we will speak to you next time. Bye for now. Thanks for watching. Pageant Sorority Access opens up on Monday, the 1st of November. To get early access, head to thepageantsorority.com and enter your email address. Hope to see you there and see you next time.